So uh, I think by now you all realize system CSDMS is the community of communities, and uh, we have little little uh, nuggets of each of these communities. We heard the human dimension and agent-based modeling and integrated assessment modeling earlier in the day. Um, to some extent, we're going to hear more. But this next talk represents back in the brain community for all us oceanographers. And we have the great Nick, Nikki Lewandowski, another Pollock. <laughs> Who's going to talk about carbon? Okay, Nikki. Polish introduction. Um, so hi everyone, I'm Nikki Lewandowski, I am indeed Polish, yeah. Um, and I'm going to talk to you today about ocean carbon and acidification, and, and I'm going to frame this talk in the context of this question that's up here on the, on the header slide. Can we predict the future of these things? And I imagine you already know the answer to the question. Who, th who thinks we can predict the future? Okay. Oh, there's a couple of hands in the back. So, so who thinks we cannot predict the future? Yes. Okay. So most of you, we cannot predict the future. The answer to this question is no. But we're not going to just stop at answering that question. We're going to try to understand why we cannot predict the future of these things. We're going to try to look at what drives the uncertainty in our prediction. And the way that I'd like to think about this is that if we understand what drives the uncertainty in our prediction, then we can work as a community to minimize those sources of uncertainty in our predictions. So I'm going to begin by showing you an animated bar plot. It's not a particularly exciting animation, but it's an animation nonetheless. And what you're going to see on the left is um, the sources of carbon to the atmosphere, and on the right, the sinks of carbon. Um, in both the atmosphere and the ocean. And you're going to see this in, in a time history. So starting in 1765 up to the present day, which is, um, I think, 2011 in this figure, what you're looking at here are the sources and sinks of anthropogenic carbon. So we as humans have done a lot of anthropogenic activities that have released extra carbon into the atmosphere. And those activities are either deforestation, slash land use change, or from the burning of fossil fuels. And what you'll see is that early on in the 1700s, the primary source of extra carbon, anthropogenic carbon to the atmosphere, was deforestation and land use change. But then starting in the mid-1800s and onward, the dominant source of anthropogenic Carbon to the atmosphere is through the burning of fossil fuels. And then you'll also see on the right that the anthropogenic carbon is being partitioned into both the ocean and the atmosphere. So let me start this um, exciting, sarcastically, video of this bar plot so you can see what happens. So we begin, hopefully that part at the bottom will go away, with the source on the, on the left in the 1800s. This is a deforestation source right here. And you can see that that extra carbon is being distributed fairly evenly between the ocean and the atmospheric reservoirs. And then as we move into the 1800s and now about 1850 and beyond, you start to see that there's an extra source due to the burning of fossil fuels. And again, that's being fairly evenly distributed between the ocean and the atmosphere. Um, and then as we move into the 1900s, the fossil fuel source just starts to take off. And actually, the net land bar, you'll notice, will shrink. You see it shrinking now? And um, the partitioning between the ocean and the atmosphere is no longer a 50-50, but the ocean is still playing a really important role in sequestering anthropogenic carbon. And so the point of this bar plot was to demonstrate that we've emitted extra carbon, and the ocean has done us a huge favor by absorbing a lot of that extra carbon. If not for the ocean absorption of anthropogenic carbon, there would be a lot more carbon in the atmosphere today, and it would be significantly warmer. So the ocean has done us this, this great favor. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with ocean carbon uptake, I thought I would tell you that the carbon uptake by the ocean is not evenly distributed. It's not that everywhere in the ocean is taking up the same amount of anthropogenic carbon. There's an uneven distribution of this anthropogenic carbon. So here, another video, this is a time lapse. Every 10 years, you can look at the total inventory or storage of anthropogenic carbon in the ocean. And that is, if I can get this to play, there we go. And what you'll notice, beginning in 1910, moving into sort of the present day, is that the anthropogenic carbon accumulation seems to be occurring in two main hotspots. The first is here in the North Atlantic, where you'll notice with every passing decade, there's an additional accumulation of anthropogenic carbon. And the second big hotspot is here in the Southern Ocean, where you'll notice um, between about 30 south and about 60 south, there's a massive accumulation of anthropogenic carbon as well. 
And so this is the present day picture, this is sort of where the movie ends. Um, and the point here is to remind all of you that the anthropogenic carbon is not evenly distributed. Some places are taking up more than others. And that uptake primarily has to do with the fact that the physical circulation allows for the uptake. Here in the North Atlantic, we have warm water from the subtropics moving northward in the Gulf Stream. As it moves northward, it loses heat to the atmosphere, it cools. CO2, carbon dioxide gas, is more soluble in cold water. And then this water is subducted through North Atlantic deep water formation and brings with it anthropogenic carbon into the interior of the ocean. Similarly, here in the Southern Ocean, we have mode and intermediate water formation, which subducts the anthropogenic carbon laden water into the interior of the Southern Ocean. So the physical circulation of the ocean is setting these patterns of anthropogenic carbon up. Okay, so this anthropogenic carbon uptake by the ocean is great for those of us who live in the atmosphere and don't want it to get too warm, but it's not particularly good for those organisms that live in the ocean, um, in particular the ones that try to build shells out of calcium carbonate, because it leads directly to ocean acidification. Um, carbon dioxide is a gas just like any other gas its solubility depends on temperature, but it's different from other gases in that when it enters the water, it actually reacts with the water to produce a number of carbonate species, here carbonic acid, bicarbonate, and carbonate ions. And in doing so, it sheds hydrogen ions. So I don't know when you all last took um, chemistry, aqueous chemistry, or even high school chemistry, maybe it was in high school. I'll remind you that these are equilibrium reactions, meaning that they can essentially run in both directions. And the way that you can think about this is it's sort of like a coupled system. If you add CO2 here on the left, this reaction gets pushed to the right, and you essentially produce more carbonic acid. This reaction gets pushed to the right, and you essentially produce more hydrogen ions. This reaction gets pushed to the right, and you essentially produce more hydrogen ions. So essentially what happens fundamentally is when you add excess carbon to the ocean, or when the ocean takes up excess carbon from the atmosphere, you increase the concentration of the hydrogen ions in seawater. And between pre-industrial times in the present day, we think that hydrogen ion concentration has gone up by approximately 30% in the surface ocean because of this uptake of anthropogenic carbon. Also, you may remember from high school chemistry uh, that the pH is negative one times the log base 10 of the hydrogen ion concentration. So that when CO2 goes up and hydrogen ion concentrations go up, the pH goes down. And so we're moving, pH of the ocean is around eight. So you're moving from a basic ocean to a less basic ocean, which is otherwise known as ocean acidification. And on the right, you're looking at a map of the actual change in the pH estimated, um, roughly estimated, from the 1700s to the 1990s. And this is a slightly misleading map. Um, every color on this color bar is a negative number. So what this suggests is that everywhere the ocean pH has dropped, but in some places it has dropped more quickly than in others. And you can see these hot spots of lower pH stand out as places where in the previous slide, the ocean storage of the anthropogenic carbon is occurring. So ocean carbon uptake, good for the atmosphere, bad for the ocean, especially bad for the organisms in the ocean that are trying to build shells out of calcium carbonate. Um, this acidification is challenging to those shell builders. Here I'm highlighting experiments that were done in laboratory um, where they simulated ocean acidification for two lower trophic level organisms on the top. This is a coccolithophore. It's a single cell uh, unicellular algae. It lives primarily in the surface of the ocean and it produces a calcium carbonate shell. Um, coccolith, these little, these little plates. It's kind of a beautiful organism when you look at it under, under a microscope. And you can see what happens when you expose this organism to lower and lower pH um, water that the shell just begins to dissolve. And then on the bottom, you're looking at the shell of a pteropod. This is, um, I like to think of these as little tiny swimming snails in the ocean. There's zooplankton. Um, and this is just the, the shell, but they're actually really beautiful. And they build a shell of calcium carbonate in the form of aragonite, so it's more soluble, actually, than the calcitic structure of this, of this shell. And you can see that the shell is almost completely dissolved when it's exposed to acidified water. So maybe you're thinking, why should I care if some shells dissolve? Does it really matter? It doesn't really matter because these organisms have only so much energy to go around. 
They eat or they photosynthesize and they collect energy. And then they have to decide how they're going to expend that energy. And if they are in an acidified ocean, they're going to need to expend a lot more energy to build and maintain their shell, which means that they will have a lot less energy to grow and they will have a lot less energy to reproduce. So that's why we're concerned. Ocean acidification, not just because individual organisms might evolve their shells, but because the community as a whole may change because of this, this change in acidification. So I hope I've at least motivated enough why we might want to understand how much ocean carbon uptake has proceeded and how much ocean carbon uptake is likely to change in the future, why we might want to predict this. Um, and so, now turning to sort of the main thrust of this talk, which is how much carbon dioxide will the ocean absorb? Between now and the middle or the end of the century, can we make a prediction for how much carbon the ocean will absorb? And what you're looking at here are estimates of this ocean carbon flux for each model that contributed to the fifth coupled model intercomparison project, or CMIP-5, so each Earth system model. And the y-axis here is the globally integrated flux. You take the CO2 flux at every location in the ocean and you integrate over the whole globe. And so you get a number that's negative, which means that there's a net uptake of carbon by the ocean. CO2 is fluxing from the atmosphere into the ocean in every one of these models. And this is a time series beginning in 2006, which is essentially the start point for all of the CMIP-5 model integrations, out to 2080. And what you can see is that for short prediction lead times, we have a pretty good sense of how much carbon the ocean will take up, right? Um, it's, it's two and a half plus or minus a few 0.1% uh, petagrams of carbon per year. But by 2080, you can see that there's a big divergence in our prediction, so such that some model iterations predict that the ocean will be taking up about one petagram of carbon per year, and others predict somewhere around six. That's a big spread, right? And that has big implications for the acidification of the ocean and has big implications for the organisms that live in the ocean, whether we follow this yellow line or whether we follow this pink line. So our prediction, you see, is uncertain, right? We cannot predict the future with much certainty. But we can start to get at why that might be. And here I color-coded these according to the emission simulation forcing scenario that they were run under. So here in yellow you see RCP 2.6. So this is sort of the... Um, most aggressive in terms of what we do as humans to mitigate our emissions. And under the RCP 2.6, you see we follow this nice trajectory where ocean carbon uptake increases and then decreases. And so by 2080, you actually, the ocean is taking up less carbon per year than it was in 2006. That would be quite good for the organisms. But if we instead follow RCP 8.5, you can see that we're down here um, in terms of, of where, we, where we take up carbon. So, so our prediction is uncertain, and you can start to see visually that the emission scenario, at least in the global sense, is what's driving this prediction uncertainty. But even if you know exactly what emission scenario you're going to follow, you still have some uncertainty, right? There's still some spread from yellow to yellow and from pink to pink here. And that spread has to do with other sources of uncertainty that we're going to explore here today. I want you to have this picture in your mind because this is a globally integrated picture. And I want you to visually compare that with this picture. This is now if you zoom in to a small region. So in this case, I've zoomed into the California current system, and um, conveniently, Enrique introduced the California current system in his talk yesterday morning. So you all have a sense that this is a region um, with an eastern boundary upwelling. It's a region where there's a lot of fisheries. And so we might be concerned about climate change in this particular region. And I can also say here that this region we know is particularly vulnerable to acidification. So we might want to know, we might want to be able to predict how much carbon uptake is going to change in this region. And what you see just looks like uh, a big mess, right? It's just a big spaghetti diagram. You can see, actually, there's, this is the zero line. So above this line, carbon is fluxing from the ocean to the atmosphere. And below this line, carbon is fluxing into the ocean. And some of these models, for some, some years of prediction, are, are predicting outgassing, and some are predicting nothing. They, they don't even agree as to the sign of the mean CO2 flux in this region. So there's quite a bit of uncertainty in our prediction. You'll notice that the uncertainty seems to be unaffected by how far out in the future you're trying to project. The uncertainty tomorrow is just as high as the uncertainty in 2080. And you'll notice that the, that the emission scenario doesn't matter at all. If you follow RCP 8.5, you follow RCP 2.6, it really doesn't matter, right? Your prediction is equally uncertain. So this is a very different picture regionally than what we saw globally. 
So, what we're going to do today is explore the various sources of prediction uncertainty. And I'm going to take a page out of a book, um, essentially a paper, that was written by Ed Hawkins and Rowan Sutton in the context of looking at um, temperature temperature perturbations in the atmosphere and whether we can predict with much certainty how much temperature in the atmosphere is going to change. We're going to apply that exact method to ocean carbon uptake to see if we can, if we can assess prediction uncertainty. And in their paper, they say that there are three main sources of prediction uncertainty for climate models. The first is what's called internal variability. It's also known as initial condition um, uncertainty. And that has to do with the fact that climate models develop their own modes of internal climate variability. An example of that would be an El Nino or a La Nina. Different climate models, or even the same climate model with slightly different initial conditions, is going to develop a different El Nino at a different time during a different year, and it's going to have a different amplitude than the next iteration. Um, and so models inherently have this, this variability, and this makes our prediction of the future somewhat uncertain. The second source of prediction uncertainty is the emissions in air. We've talked a little bit about this already, but if we follow our CPA 0.5, the O2 in the atmosphere is likely to be higher in 2100 than if we follow our CP 2.6, and that will, of course, affect the amount of CO2 that is dissolved into the ocean in some regions. And if you are interested, um, this is right there. That's where we are as of last year. So unfortunately, it seems as though we are tracking RCP 8.5 based on the predictions that were made by these um, scenario assessments back in 2005 and 2006. And then the third source of uncertainty is actually a big one. It's model structure. And the idea that different climate models are structured differently. So if you want to write a climate model or an Earth system model, you have to write down the mathematical expressions that you want to solve. And then you have to decide, how are you going to solve them using a computer? What numerical methods are you going to employ? What is your grid size going to be? What is your grid going to be shaped like? How do you parameterize the things that you can't represent in the grid? All of those things are going to be different from climate model to climate model, and they're going to therefore affect the outcome. So even with the same emission scenario, you're going to get a different result because the structure of your model is different. Similarly, different climate models have some have similar and different components. So here are some examples. This is the NCAR Community Earth System Model, which you can see, and, and John Francois introduced this yesterday, has an atmosphere component, an ocean component, sea ice, and land ice, and then they're all coupled together via the coupler. This is the Princeton model, where you can see it has an ocean, an atmosphere, land, and, and, uh, and sea ice, but, but the coupling but these, these two components appear to be much smaller than they are in the NCAR model. And then this is the French model, um, where you can see that the atmosphere model really is dominant, and the land becomes part of the atmosphere model, um, as opposed to being a standalone component of the model. And so this is coupled together differently as well. And, and for those of you who are interested, this little gray circle right here is a thousand lines of code. So each one of these bubbles has <laughs> a, big, a big amount of code. So these models have a lot, a lot of lines of code. So of course, this is going to affect our prediction, right? How, how the model is structured is going to affect our prediction. Okay, so let's go ahead and do this. Let's assess the prediction uncertainty. We have two tools to do this. The first is what John Fenstall introduced yesterday. This is an ensemble of simulations done with a single climate model. This is used, using the community Earth system model, the NCAR climate model. Um, can we predict the CO2 uptake in the ocean and how it might change from year to year and from emission scenario to emission scenario? And I'll remind you how they did this. They took a singular climate model and they did a long control integration. Then in 1920, they applied round off level temperature differences to the atmosphere, something like 10 to the negative 14K. You guys remember hearing this yesterday from John Gensler? And that, so that's a butterfly effect and it, it, it generated a completely different climate in each one of these ensemble members. And they did this 40 different time here and 15 different times here. And so from 1920 to 2005, they ran these, these ensemble nodes under historical forcing, what we measured in the atmosphere. And then from 2006 until 2080, they ran these ensemble members under two different forcing scenarios. The medium ensemble here under RCP 4.5, it's called medium because there are only 15 members. And the large ensemble down here, which was run under RCP 8.5, is called large because it has 40 ensemble members. This is a really, really cool tool for looking at internal climate variability because you now have multiple realizations of climate variability in each of these ensemble members that you can really truly analyze for a given prediction lead time. It's also a fantastic tool for looking at the, the influence of the emission scenario on the uptake of carbon and how that might affect your prediction uncertainty. 
And so we're going to do both of those things with this model, but I should point out that we, of course, cannot assess model structural uncertainty with this model because it's just one model. So we're also going to contrast this with the results that we get from the CMIP5 archive, where we have a variety of model structures. We don't necessarily trust our measure of internal variability as much in the CMIP5 models because we have only one ensemble member for a lot of these models. But nevertheless, we can do this analysis and start to get at how the structural uncertainty um, matters. Okay, so what you're looking at here in the time series is the integrated, globally integrated carbon uptake from the CESM ensemble. The y-axis is negative, indicating the ocean is taking up carbon. This is 2010, this is 2080. Each thin line is an individual ensemble member. The thick lines are the ensemble mean. So, contrast that with what you find in the California current system. It looks just like the CMIP 5 picture, the spaghetti diagram that I showed you earlier. Here, color-coded by emission scenario, it's just a big, big spread in terms of carbon uptake in this region. And you'll notice that, again, it doesn't seem to matter what emission scenario you follow until perhaps right here at the very end we start slightly to see a difference between the blue simulations and the red simulations or the pink simulations. Down here, what I've done is I've quantified the actual uncertainty in this prediction. So this is what is called the scaled uncertainty. It's the standard deviation divided by the mean prediction. And it shows you what I think you can probably see with your eye in the top picture, that uncertainty, our prediction uncertainty, grows with prediction lead time um, in the globally integrated case, right? So we trust our prediction here. We don't so much trust our prediction here, right? And because this is a scaled quantity, you can directly compare it with any region and any model and have the exact same y-axis. So right over here on the same y-axis, we're looking at the uncertainty in the California current system, and you'll notice that even for 2007, a prediction lead time of one year, the scale of uncertainty is higher than it is globally for almost all prediction lead times. You start with a very high uncertainty. That uncertainty doesn't grow much with time. It's actually fairly flat in comparison to the globally integrated case. So let's now dive a little bit deeper into understanding what causes the uncertainty. So here, what you're looking at on the y-axis is the fraction of the total variance, essentially what is the driver of the uncertainty in your prediction. And in the CSM ensembles, we have two sources. We have internal variability and we have scenario uncertainty. Those are our two sources of uncertainty. Globally, you can see that for short prediction lead times, the internal variability dominates the uncertainty. But then, as soon as 2015, so that seems like today, the, the dominant source of uncertainty is the emission scenario. But in the California current system, it's almost exactly opposite. So here, in the, in the internal climate variability dominates the uncertainty until out to 2070 in this simulation. It is only then that the emission scenario begins to matter. Right? So by understanding this, we now have a better understanding of where we can potentially invest our resources to improve our prediction. Okay, so I've done the same thing with the CMIP 5 models, and we can argue to the cows come home about whether this internal um, number is right. I would say probably not exactly, because we only have one ensemble member. But nevertheless, what, what jumps out at you um, is that the model overlaying in blue plays a really important role for short prediction lead times in controlling the uncertainty in our prediction. And then after about 2030, the emission scenario dominates. But in the California current system, model structure dominates the uncertainty. So if you can get the model structure right, you can predict the future, right? Essentially, that's what this says. Um, if you imagine that the blue lines aren't there, the red and the green lines on these, pl on these um, plots look a lot like they did on the previous slide. So it suggests that our method is at least robust from CSL ensembles to CMIP-5 models, that here you see internal variability is more important than scenario, and here you see scenario is more important than internal variability. Okay, so we went ahead and did this everywhere across the globe. So rather than doing it globally integrated in one tiny region, we actually broke the globe into 17 different biogeographical biomes, and they're defined based on the mean abundance of phytoplankton in the biome and the temperature of the biome and how much ice is there seasonally, things that might matter for biology in the ocean, essentially. And we calculated the uncertainty in, in the prediction in each of the biomes, and we did this for every year, for all prediction lead times. And so here you're looking at three time slices. This is for a prediction lead time of four years in 2010, this is in 2045, and this is in 2080. And the color, the scaled uncertainty here is shown in the color bar. The higher 
um, certainty, the yellow is the color. And you'll notice that even four years out, there are some reasons where the uncertainty going to be larger than one. It's larger than it was in the entire California current system. Um, so you, you don't really want to try to predict the future in the Western Equatorial Pacific. You're, you're not going to do particularly well. And also what stood out in, in this is the... the the um, subtropical Atlantic, the South Subtropical Atlantic Zone, also very high uncertainty. This might be useful to you if you're thinking about, well, I'd like to desi design a, some sort of observational campaign to go out and measure acidification in the ocean, how it changes with time. Well, if you're going to do that, don't go here because it's going to be tricky to interpret your results, right? You might want to go somewhere that's more blue. Um, and then you can see how that uncertainty changes with time over the course of the simulation. And at the end, you can see here that almost the entire globe is, is yellow, um, indicating that we don't touch a prediction in 2080 hardly anywhere in the CSM cells. So then we went ahead and went into every biome and then partitioned the uncertainty. We did this analysis of variance to see, is it internal variability or is it a mission scenario? And what we found is that the internal variability dominates to a certain point, and then the emission scenario takes over. And so essentially what we're looking at here is a map of when these lines cross. When exactly does the scenario take over as the most important source of uncertainty in years, so 2040 to 2080 and beyond. So the dark colors are places where the scenario uncertainty takes over early, and light colors are places where the scenario uncertainty takes over late. And then there's even some white areas here where, forget it, the scenario uncertainty never matters. It's actually only internal climate variability that's dominating your uncertainty. Um, so definitely don't don't go out here and try to observe things. That's what this model suggests. But interestingly, what you see here are these dark regions are exactly the places where we saw, like eight slides ago, the ocean anthropogenic carbon um, is being stored. Right. So here in the North Atlantic, and here in the Southern Ocean, those hot spots for ocean anthropogenic carbon storage are places where the emission scenario matters. And that actually makes sense, right? These are places where the ocean has accumulated carbon, where we expect the ocean to continue to accumulate carbon. So the emission scenario stands out as the dominant source of prediction uncertainty in these regions before it does in other regions. Okay, so we then also did this for the CMIP5 model. So again, not 100% trusting our internal variability, but nevertheless, we want to assess model structure. And I want to point out that this color bar is now from 0 to 2. On the previous slide, it was from 0 to 1. Um, so overall, there's just a heck of a lot more uncertainty in the CMIP5 models than there is in the CESM ensembles. And that probably has to do with the fact that there is structural uncertainty when we look at the CMIP5 that wasn't there in CESM. And then you see that there are places where, I mean, most of the globe we can't trust our prediction even four years out. So, seeing that five models are, we are challenged to look at prediction in these particular biomes on the biome scale um, for ocean carbon uptake even four years out. And then uncertainty really doesn't 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 shrink at all. It just continues to grow in most of these. And then we went ahead and did the same sort of analysis. But here our concern is when does the model structural uncertainty? get taken over by the emission scenario uncertainty. When does the blue line cross the green line? And white means never, which means that in those biomes, the model structure is the dominant source of uncertainty for all prediction lead times. And you can see that that is almost everywhere. There are a few places where that happens, and where it does happen, it's fairly late in the time period. So, I'm running out of time, and here are my conclusions. I hope that I've convinced you that predictions of the future ocean carbon sink are fraught with uncertainty. This is particularly true at regional scales. The three sources of prediction uncertainty can vary with prediction lead time. They can vary with spatial averaging scale, and they vary from region to region. Some regions are more inherently more uncertain than others. And then finally, if we want to produce reliable predictions on regional scales, I would argue that we should invest in reducing model structural uncertainty. Certainly not going to tell you how we do that. Just saying that we probably should invest in that. Um, if you think about emission scenario development, the physical science community is really not super responsible for developing emission scenarios. So we have little say in how that goes. And also, internal variability is, is sort of an aleatoric thing. It, it, there's, that's always going to be there, right? We can't necessarily correct for that um, initial condition uncertainty, but we could perhaps reduce uncertainty by reducing uncertainty in model structure. So that's all. Thank you for your attention.
um, numerical methods. Two words is the definition of the uncertainty in model spectrum. Is that what you mean? Numerical methods. Yes. That's what I would say. <laughs> um, so, in, in investigating, so, so evaluating model adequacy is one of the things I do most. And, um, and um, even a much simpler model, it's not easy. Um, but if, if all you're using are scenario representations, it's really tough to get to things, and, and these models take a long time to run. So there are a whole bunch of methods that, that are very rarely used. They use a little bit, in, in, that I understand, in, in, in um, uh, 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 global climate modeling, but, but might be of some assistance. Yeah, and we have thought about, like, can we, can we rank the models according to their skill in representing carbon uptake and, and use that to help us reduce the uncertainty right, in model structure or things like that? Can, can we evaluate the skill in a more broader, in a broader sense? Yeah, so the first step we usually is sensitivity analysis. Like what matters? Like you have all that, all these processes in there. And you have, a, I mean, just from fiddling with them, you have some idea of what matters, but there might, if you analyze it in a more, um, uh, structured way, you might have, there might be some surprises there. Yeah, so that's usually, you know, to my mind, the first step. And then, and then you can kind of go from there and start looking at, okay, what are the data that are dominating? Right, right, right. So, right, and one of the problems we run into with that skills open is that so in, some, in some biomes, a model does really, really well, and then you go to a neighboring biome and it, it flunks out. And so how do you, how do you assess skill when it changes from region to region? Exactly, exactly. exactly. So there's right. nonlinearities in right. there, and there's, right, right. And so trying to put it into a framework that uses fewer model runs and yet delves into that, yeah. I think it's probably possible. Mm -hmm. Just for a question about my ignorance in the process in the uh, in the low emission scenarios, the, the uptake rate decreased, right? Mm -hmm. Became less negative right. towards the end. Is that is that because? Um, um, I guess my question is: Does that have anything to do with temperature? And is that actually a good proxy for? Acidification, does the acidification rate really slow down or it, it, has it gotten warmer? Yeah, temperature is involved, but it's not the driving force. The driving force is that in those, in RCP 2.6, we actually get some net negative emissions by 2100. Yeah, um, that's, that's really ambitious, as I said, aggressive scenario. Like, we really get our stuff together and we, we make sure we reduce those emissions. And so there's a lot less carbon in the atmosphere to dissolve into the ocean. And so the ocean uptake decreases in those scenarios. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you.